Thursday night, uh, we do our City Life program. And so most of the youth that we serve uh, don't have transportation. So that's, uh, that's, that's where I come in. <laughs> Oh, hey, Elizabeth. Hi. How you doing? Good. Good. Sorry, nobody cares. Come on. I care. Oh, my God. Hey, Kariana. I care, Kariana. <laughs> she said, don't nobody. I care. <laughs> This is city life. And we get together, we have fun. Um, there's usually a message that's delivered. We have dinner and basically it's a chance to, we want to introduce young people to Jesus and to the gospel. And we also want to uh, help them to go deeper. Uh, in relationship with us and in relationship with Christ. I am technically in charge of the K-Play program, which that is where we're trying to build relationships, not only with, with the kids, which all of our ministries are about building relationships with the kids, but to reconcile relationships between youth and police. spent some time living with like my grandparents. I had a difficult family situation. So even though Landrum, South Carolina or like Polk County, North Carolina and Rockford don't have a lot in common, uh, my story and their story may be pretty similar. My parents split up and got divorced when I was around three. And then some stuff went down and uh, it was kind of messy. And my dad ended up getting custody of me. me. Me and my dad didn't get along great. You know, life has a way of hardening individuals and causing anger and pain. You know, they say hurt people hurt people. And I think that as I got older, I realized that my dad had been through a lot and that contributed to the person he became. And I couldn't understand that when I was younger, but now I understand it a little bit better. Middle school freaking sucked. Like it was just awful for me. I was really overweight. I was weird. I was just a weird, awkward kid. Just a rough time to be old Adam, man. I was trying to find my identity and I would like try on different identities. And like, I would look at kids and I'd be like, oh, they're cool, I wanna be like them. And then like, I thought everything was gonna get better once I got into high school. And no joke, probably a month into high school, this guy was like, he was like the captain of the wrestling team, stud senior. And he was like, you want some? And I'm like, no, I do not. I don't want any. 
you know, because I was I was like five foot eight, probably the same weight I am. I was like probably 240, but like I was made out of like marshmallow fluff. So he pushes me. You know, what are you doing when somebody pushes you? You don't want to look like no punk. You push him back. Well, I go to push him back. Well, this is this is the captain of the wrestling team. He just grabs me and holds me down and beats me mercilessly in front of the entire school. Like this dude beat the brakes off me. And then finally the gym teacher who like was on the practice squad for the Cowboys back in the day comes in and scoops him off of me. But that that was really tough for me. That was probably one of the darkest times for me. Stuff at home sucked, stuff at school sucked. I was kind of done with it and and I got I got like suicidal and stuff and I almost I almost took my life. I had gotten to the point to where I just I didn't I didn't see any more light. I didn't think that anything was going to get better. I didn't feel like I just felt like life was going to kind of always suck, man. And uh I didn't like myself and didn't too many other people seem to like me very much either. And I was just kind of done. And so uh, I knew where there was a loaded 45 in my house. And I went and I got it. And, uh, and I put it up to my head. And I heard, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a voice or like a inner something, just kind of telling me, hey, it's gonna get better. Don't do it, it's gonna get better. And I've had a lot of experiences. Uh, yeah, man, that was that was God inter intervening in my life and giving me hope and saving me. This week, we mark the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. The 9-11 attacks. 9-11. On 9-11. I was in junior English class when 9-11 happened. All of a sudden, this lady opens our door and she goes, we're under attack, we're under attack. Somebody's attacking us. And they wheel a TV in on a cart. They wheel this thing in on a cart, plug it in and turn it on to the news. And like, I watch it all happen live. And keep in mind, man, I ain't, I don't like bullies, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the kind, you come at me, I got something for you. And I'm like, somebody about to get your tail whooped. And I think that that right then, I knew. Like, from then on, it was like, oh, well, I could still potentially play college football. Or if that doesn't work out, I'm going in the Army. My senior year, I ended up blowing my knee in the playoffs for my very last football game in high school. It was like a minute, 52 seconds left on the clock. I remember laying on the field, looking at the clock and being like, man, two more minutes. <laughs> I just had to make it two more minutes. And I knew college football was over. And see, that's when I really started getting hard into the party and the drugs and stuff was like, the rest of my senior year. And then it kind of came together that the Army was what I needed to do. I did one station unit training. So you do basic training and then you do AIT, uh, but you do it all at once and you get the, the same drill sergeants the entire time. So it's like you get double the time with the drill sergeants. My drill sergeant was a jump master and 
He was super, super, super hula about the 82nd Airborne. That was his thing. He was like, Palmer! And he talked like this all the time. Palmer, why didn't you sign up for Airborne School, Palmer? And I was like, and so keep in mind, this drill sergeant is probably 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, and I said, well, because I heard that you were 6'4 before you went to dr jump school drill, son. <laughs> and he uh, he didn't laugh. He, he, he smiled a little. And then he smoked the piss out of me, like, relentlessly for about the next 45 minutes. And then I became one of his favorites because he was always making me do push-ups. So I get a bunch of letters for my birthday, like a week after my birthday. And Drill Sergeant Connolly happened to be doing mail call that night. So he's in the kill zone and he's like, Palmer, you've got a lot of people that love you, Palmer. And I, no joke, I guess I probably had like 11 or 12 or 14 letters. It was a double digit amount. And he threw them in the kill zone and he said, why are so many people writing you, Palmer? And I was like, uh, cause I, th I think it's probably because of my birthday, Drill Sergeant. And he was, oh, happy birthday, Palmer. To reward you, I'm going to give you the gift of toughness, Palmer. You're going to pay 10 push-ups for each one of these letters, Palmer. So, like, I had to get in the kill zone and do like 140 push-ups. Like, go try to do 140 push-ups. You're doing like four or five at a time for an extended period and just hitting muscle failure over and over again, you know? And so that was, yeah, that was when I, yeah, that's how I made friends with Drill Sergeant Connolly. April 9th was big. Uh, so like the, the Mahdi army had basically taken over all of the major cities in Iraq. And it was just like this huge offensive where they just took over all the police stations, all of the checkpoints, everything. And then like we had to go take everything back. And so that was fighting all day. Like, I mean, it was, I wasn't in the fighting all day. We were back. I don't know why they left us back, you know, but we were. And we could hear explosions and gunfire. All the time. From like four, from like three, four o'clock in the morning. Always. And then that evening, they called us up and they said, hey, check it out. All of the Bradleys are running low on 25 Mike Mike. So that's the bigger gun on a Bradley fighting vehicle, 25 millimeter cannon. We need you guys to go across the city to Fob Warhorse, get as much ammunition as you can carry on these trucks that we're sending with you, and then bring it back across the city so that we can call in all of the Bradleys and resupply. And they said, all routes are black. You will come under enemy contact. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So <clears throat> it doesn't really matter which way you go. It doesn't really matter which way you come back. You're gonna get hit. And that was terrifying. I remember being so scared, and then when it happened, like, it started off, we got hit with 
three or four I small IEDs just and then the RPGs came in. And so like like immediately there's eight to twelve explosions just all around our whole patrol. And then they opened up with the small arms fire. And like we're in a city and it's coming from the alleys, it's coming from the rooftops, it's coming from the window. Just like, and we're rolling. So I'm just seeing tracers bounce everywhere. I can't figure out who to shoot at. Like I can't see muzzle flashes. I'm just like, just a full blown WTF moment. And I just froze up. I just froze up. I didn't even pull the trigger. I didn't have any. It was just a sensory overload, man. It was like Star Wars, man. Like tracers, it was crazy. And like we didn't stay and fight it out. Like our directives were, you let nothing stop you. You get to that other fob. So we get to the other fob, and like we just got shot up. We just got RPG. So like we're loading up all this ammunition while the mechanics are, like the entire team of mechanics is trying to fix our vehicles. Cause like, we just went through a lot of metal flying around, right? And so like on, on the way back, we went a different route and we got engaged with a similar attack, but it was from a little bit further out. It was from several different positions that were identifiable and we ended up kicking a little tail on that one. Two of the guys that I knew uh, from that platoon had gotten killed in an IED. And uh, they sent us out on a sniper mission, small kill team operation, to um, overwatch this area. It was near where those other guys had died, and it was a, probably about a month later, if I'm not mistaken. And we actually, we, we sat on top of this abandoned gas station all day. We walked in in the nighttime. We walked in like seven, eight miles, walked in and took it at like four or five o'clock in the morning. And then we just stayed there and set up an overwatch on the rooftop. We kept seeing guys come along and they would just kind of stand on the side of the road. Cause they did it a few times and they had people watching. And so our first sergeant and his patrol was coming through and we watched them go through and we were communicating with them because just in case we popped up with one of them to shoot us. So we watched them go through and at the same time that they're going through across the river, we see this kid on a cell phone talking to somebody and he's like pointing across the river at our first sergeant's patrol and talking to somebody. And I'm like, hey man, I'm getting some vibes here, man. What's up, you know? And like, my sniper's on the radio asking if he should take the shot on this kid. They knew once a patrol comes through, there's probably not gonna be another one for a while. So that's what they were waiting on, was that patrol to come through. And then that guy was signaling the IED emplacers to come and put in the IED. 
So about five minutes after first sergeant's uh, crew rolled through, we I see I spot two guys coming from this village, and I see them get into a car up the road, and uh, they're coming down. And I noticed it's weighing kind of low on the shocks. It was kind of sketchy, and I told my sniper, "Hey, man, I got a couple possibles here." They pulled up. They stopped the car right in front of an IED hole where one had already blown up and they popped the trunk on the hatchback and we see the propane tank and like the wires hanging out of it and stuff like that. We were like, green light. So my buddy pops up to take a shot. Well, when he popped up to a knee, I guess the change in the silhouette, one of the guys saw it. And when he did, they panicked and they like shut the shut the hood, I mean the trunk, and ran and jumped in the car, right? We're trying to get clearance to take the shot and he couldn't get it. And so finally he was like, I was like, Hud, take the shot, dude. We got positive ID, just take the shot. And so he took the shot and he got the driver of the car. And then when the car flipped over, the two guys got out and then I got the two guys. And so that was, I mean, that was a successful small kill team operation. Maybe, maybe it saved somebody's life. Maybe it, I don't know, saved a few tires. I don't know. I have trouble living with that, not because I did my job and not because I killed enemy soldiers, you know, or insurgents or whatever you want to call them. You know, I killed people that were going to kill me and my people. But when they when they recovered the bodies, they each had 150 US dollars in their pocket. Now, put that in perspective. Money over there, US money goes a lot further than it goes over here. And I thought about all the guys that I grew up with in trailer parks and different things like that or in project apartments and thought, man, if somebody just said, hey, man, I'll give you hundred, i give you, i give you $15,000 to go do one day of work. At that point, I realized that maybe we weren't that different. It doesn't bother me that I killed him. It was the fact that I was so happy about it. We celebrated killing those guys. We celebrated that being a successful operation. We cheered. We were happy. We high-fived each other like we'd scored a touchdown. Three human beings are no longer on this planet. Iraqi or not, three human beings are no longer on this planet. And I celebrated that. And there's something inherently wrong with you if you can enjoy and celebrate the killing of another human being. Basically what they did was, is they said, hey, we're taking a U.S. forces stand down and we don't want any U.S. forces outside the gate for like a week. And we want the Iraqis to go out and do the patrols and make sure there's no bombs around and all that fun stuff. Well, the first patrol out the gate after the week long hiatus of combat operations happened to be my platoon. <laughs> and there was a really good, well-in-placed EFP on our route. I had this dream of being like a Golden Gloves boxer, right? I loved, like to fight, was pretty decent at it. And like, I was like, I want to box. So after that tour, I mean, I was still in my early to mid twenties. I was like, man, I'll go back. I'll get in some amateur tournaments and I'll knock some people out. Maybe I can do something. Maybe I can make golden gloves or something like that, you know? And I was talking to my driver. I said, man, you know what? 
this right hand right here, this thing is catastrophic. I said, if you give me about six more months, this thing would be a cataclysmic, life-altering event if I was to hit you with it. <laughs> and I was like, I said, like, you know what? You know what? I said, like, man, I'll hit you in your shoulder right now. Knock you through that up armored door. We'll just leave you on the side of the road, pick you up on the way back. And my gunner was yelling and he was like, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I was like, get somebody up on that 50, get him down out the hatch. So uh, the guys in the back of the MRAP, they were like, they were pulling him down out the hatch and stuff. And, and I had a medic with me, fortunately. And my driver looked over at me and he was like, he was like, Sarpy, you're jacked up. And the first thing I noticed was like, I noticed my leg, so I got I got hit like right here. That's where a wheel bearing went in, and it uh that like I had arterial bleeding from that, and that was the first thing I noticed was like I looked at that, and then I would see just a gush down my pants leg every time like my heart would beat, you know, and I'm like, oh, this ain't good, and I was like. I was like, oh no, that might be my femoral artery. And so the first thing you do is you got severe bleeding. The first thing you do is you put pressure on the wound, right? So I go to put pressure on it and my hand is flopping around like it's hanging down here by my elbow. As you can see, like that's all thigh. The whole outside of my forearm was gone. And my hand was just hanging down here. Both of the bones were were completely like, like most of this bone was gone. And then my radius was completely broken in half. So my hand, I picked up my arm and my hand's just hanging right here. And like the weirdest thing was like trying to move my hand and my fingers wouldn't work. And like the dash had come down and it broke my femur right here above the knee, like clean off right there and I was trapped because of the dash and then I broke my tibia down here from them kind of getting crushed and then uh they got me into the other truck and like I started going into shop I got to the point where I couldn't move anymore I got to the point where I couldn't talk anymore so I was like this isn't good and I could still hear, I could still see, I was still very conscious, I could still feel pain. I just couldn't do anything. It was like being a prisoner in my own body. And I was like, I think I'm about to die. And I knew that I had a lot of dirt on me and I knew that I'd done a lot of things wrong and I knew that I had not walked with God like I should have. And I knew that I had hurt a lot of people and and so like I had a lot of stuff on me that had caused me to get further and further away from God. And in that moment, I felt like I was about to die and that I was about to be judged and I was going to be condemned. And I knew that I deserved it and I knew that I had it coming. And so I said, you know what, Lord? I've been hearing about you my whole life. I said, I believe, man. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for our sins. And I said, and I believe that you can forgive me. I said, whether, uh, whether I live or die today, from here on out, man, I'm yours. And uh, I just said, you know, take care of my girls. Cause I mean, I just, just got married and we had just had a daughter. My daughter was three months old when I got blown up. And I was like, just take care of my girls, man. I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. And I remember like as soon as I got done praying, my gunner, who had a piece of shrapnel on his leg, jumps up, grabs the needle out of the medic's hand and sticks me first try and gets an IV going. And I come out of shock. And I had this piece that I can't explain 
that I've only experienced just a couple of times since then. Like in Alaska, looking over some glacial lake with just nothing but creation around you. Like being, like there's this spot on the French Broad River in North Carolina when I'm rafting down this river and you go through a rapid and you, and it just becomes calm. And there's just this beautiful valley that's been there for tens of thousands of years before you ever existed. And it's still just as beautiful as it ever was, like that feeling. And I felt that in the back of that truck, even though I was all blown up. And I just knew that no matter what happened, whether I lived or died, that I was gonna be okay. How was the rehabilitation process through all that? Oh, it sucked. It was ho it was horrible. It was awful. Um, I was stuck in a hospital bed for three weeks. Like I couldn't even get into a wheelchair for three weeks. And I, I remember just hearing all these negative thoughts. Am I ever going to walk again? Am I going to lose my arm? What kind of husband are you going to be? She didn't sign up for this. Now she's going to be stuck with an invalid, disabled husband. How useful am I going to be? How much am I going to get back? Because in a hospital bed and you can't move, you don't know. And those questions eat you up. It's like being a kid and you're in the darkness and the shadows become monsters. I started to get suicidal again for probably the first time since, you know, since my freshman year of high school. Maybe if I just, maybe if I just ended it, it'd be better for everybody. Because then she could move on. She could have a real husband. My daughter is three months old. She'll never even remember me. I can just be pictures to her. And she could just remember that her daddy was a soldier. He was a hero. And that'll be it. And she won't be stuck with the real thing. And. My first day I was able to get into the wheelchair, my grandmother was wheeling me down to get a haircut. And I'm staring at the floor tiles and I'm trying to figure out some way to kill myself. And I'm like, I can't even come up with anything. I was like, wow, you're this bad dude. And you can't even, can't even kill yourself. And I heard a voice say, keep your head up. And I picked up my head and there was a dude on a hospital bed and he had lost all four limbs and an eye. And he looked at me and he said, keep your head up, it gets better. And I remembered the voice that I heard when I was 14 saying, don't do it, it's gonna get better. And like those two things were connected to me and that dude, that dude saved my life, I think, because I said, you know what? If this guy, after everything he's lost, could be trying to encourage and motivate me, I was like, I got no excuse. I think that my experience with God was real. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure it out. And not long after that, I had a chaplain show up in my room and he handed me a Bible. And I said, I'm gonna encourage and I'm gonna motivate as many people as possible for the rest of my life. And then God gave me this idea to go on a crazy mission trip. And so me and another Purple Heart vet, we went 48 states in 48 days. And we, uh, we did mainly homeless outreach and we'd stop in a big city in each state every day and we would hand out cold bottles of water and granola bars and Bibles and gospel tracts and pray with people and love on people, and encourage people. And then we'd get in our van and we'd go to the next place and then we'd sleep at a rest stop or a Walmart parking lot and go to work again. Uh, so Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, um, we don't feel like we fit in. We don't feel like we're understood. Um, and, 
and that's and that's not anybody's fault, right? That's just because of the experiences we've been through, and there's a separation there. Uh, I ask that if you have some of those people that you're tied to, check on them, uh, love on them, May, let them know that they matter and that their life has value and worth. You know, push them into volunteer opportunities, force them to get out of their house, away from their Xbox or their PlayStation or their bottle of whiskey or whatever, and help bring life to them, you know, because man, just so many of us aren't doing good. Um, and then, you know, like that's the thing is like, be that person, you know? Like, be the person that chooses to make a positive impact on the lives of other people. Instead of, you know what? I'm just gonna say it. It's not all about you. So, uh, quit whining, make a difference. All right, there you go. Perfect, perfect. Two minutes to spare. There we go. Fantastic. <laughs> what you get? Hey, what is she doing, man? 